Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Ben and an Elephant. And today, just before we head up to New Jersey, actually, to break bread with our extended family, I want to share with you our 2019 Gear of the Year awards. Most especially, most enjoyably for me, our 2019 Elephant Award. But please hold that thought until the very end when I announce the winner. Or you can check out the index to this video in the show notes below, if I remember to do them, so that you can just fast forward to what's interesting to you. Let's start with our 2019 audio gear of the year. Now, way back in April, I provisionally named Rhodes Wireless Go our 2019 audio gear of the year. How daring of me. The Go was, remains, innovative, functional, inexpensive at just 199 bucks, and reset our expectations for what a wireless lab system could be at the price. But it turned out that the proviso was warranted. Beyond the fact that the most significant compromise Rode had to make in packing so much into so little was that facing away from the camera could be enough to block the signal, which didn't matter that much to me personally because I don't turn away from the camera. Pico Gear, with its dual channel Pico Mic wireless lab system, and then Saramonic with its Blink 500 showed up. Both were good enough to warrant close inspection, though in the end, neither was able to quite wrest the title away from the Rode. So, Honorable mentions to them both. Next. Lighting gear of the year. Now, I'm not one of those people who gets excited about rigging up a camera or packing up lots of stuff for on-location shooting. I like traveling as lightly as possible, and I just get annoyed with every ounce that I have to add. But I also like shooting as close to base ISO as possible, so I almost always light my scenes, especially when we're recording on the street. Last year... I found Luxley's Viola, and it became my go-to for on-camera or just off-camera lighting. It was superseded for certain use cases by Aperture's waterproof, even more compact Amaron ALMW. But this year's honor for Lighting Gear of the Year goes to Bowling's P1, with honorable mention going to LumCube's bicolor LED panel and power bank. Both are about the size of my iPhone 11 Pro. Both offer high CRI, reasonably bright lighting, and both offer at least a modest amount of diffusion. The bowling edges out the LumCube due to superior runtime, higher output, RGB, and special effects the LumCube panel omits. I'd be happy with either one, though, giving the nod actually to the LumCube for what we do because we don't need effects or RGB color, I like having a power bank for my iPhone, and the Loom Cube is a little more svelte and comfortable in hand. I think one more iteration of each, in which they are made weather-resistant enough to be used without fear in a downpour, with buttons easily manipulated with gloves on, and I can stop searching for the perfect on-camera light, at least until someone figures out how to circumvent the laws of physics to provide better diffusion. Next, Drone of the Year. It was only after we were well underway on what became our 20-plus webisode documentary series on the Mariner East Hazardous Liquids Pipeline that I finally obtained an FAA Part 107 remote pilot's license. I thought it appropriate, given our use of our DJI Phantom 3 Professional 4K I'd bought earlier for B-roll. When the Mavic Air came out in 2018, I quickly sold the Phantom, figuring I'd buy the Air. But then I realized two things. One, by that point, Our documentary series was well on its way to being complete. And two, I saw no use for a drone from that point forward, again, for what we do, due to increasingly onerous regulations. I pocketed the money and waited, knowing that the pace of change in the drone industry is so dramatic that if I could only hold out, something better and or less expensive would come along. And so it has. Congrats to DJI for the new Mavic Mini. The Mini is essentially a decontented, downsized, 249-gram version of the Mavic Air, that number is important, that relieves its operator of many of the restrictions placed on an aircraft just one gram more. At 400 bucks, you do sacrifice 4K, some of the intelligent flight modes, anti-collision sensors, a little flight time, some manual control, and the high-performance OcuSync system. But you know what? It gives up much less than you might imagine to the drone I used to film the series, which I bought for three times the price of the Mini. Well done, guys. Next up, more interesting, lens of the year. In an age of 40 or 50 megapixel full-frame cameras, shorter flange distances and wider lens mounts, and the rise of computer-aided design, manufacturing, and in-body software correction, 
the ability to see, design, and deliver higher optical performance verges on the startling. You don't need to pixel peep to see the differences. At least Claudia and I don't, though it's more like intuiting, feeling. But there have been so many outstanding optics that it wasn't easy to narrow the list down to the six lenses upon which I've decided to bestow Lens of the Year awards. Four primes and two zooms, although I am a primes kind of guy. You may argue that there are other lenses more deserving. Reasonable people can disagree, but these awards are based on, and therefore limited to, lenses I've actually used. Sony, for example, has moved beyond electronics to become a first-tier lens manufacturer. This year, with their $750.35 1.8 FE full frame and $2,000 FE 135 1.8, they've shown once again that they can deliver stunning optical performance at accessible prices as well as at the more rarefied levels of the G Master series. I'm talking sharpness, micro contrast, and chromatic aberration correction in either case that will stand up at least to the 61 megapixels of the A7R4, something that cannot be said even of some of their own older G Masters. Nikon. Wow, has delivered two lenses during these last 12 months, which are reason enough to enter the Z ecosystem. The sub $500 Nikkor Z51.8 and the $2,000 Nikkor Z24-72.8. to Again, these are lenses which offer outstanding results, and those results are visible without pixel peeping. Another zoom deserving lens of the year accolades is the $1,800 Leica DG Vario Sumalux 10-25-1.7 in micro four-thirds mount. Yeah, it's expensive and big, especially given the Micro Four Thirds camera for which it is designed. But it is one of the most compelling reasons to enter or remain in the Micro Four Thirds space, proving that you don't need to go to full frame for wonderful sharpness, color, and shallow depth of field. If we could only have one lens for the Micro Four Thirds GH5 that we use for most of our work, this would be it. But if there is one lens above all others in this group, spoiler alert, there is. If I could limit my selection to just one lens, which I don't because I'm making up the categories as I go along, it would have to be Leica's Sumicron SL35mm f2. Never mind that Peter Carbe, the man in charge of Leica Camera's optical design, told me that he thinks it's the best lens ever made. I saw it with my own two eyes after just two shots. Of course, at just north of five grand, it ought to be. But it is. And because it is, it is a lens for the ages, the last 35 I ever planned getting. I'm just waiting for one to become available as I speak. In fact, it has been a stellar year for glass. There are any number of lenses worthy of honorable mention, from Panasonic's Lumix S-Pro 51.4 to Nikon's other Nikkor Z primes and Sony's slightly older 24mm 1.4 G Master. Instead of going through each one, time is short. As I said, we do have to drive up to New Jersey for Thanksgiving shortly. I'll simply also award lens lines of the year to Sony, Leica, and Nikon. As I said, what a year. Let's move on to cameras before I run out of steam or you run out of patience. The Compact Zoom Camera of the Year Award goes to the Sony RX107. I don't really like cameras this small or this fiddly, and I can become easily frustrated with cameras far less complicated. Not only that, the entire point-and-shoot segment has been decimated by smartphones. Smartphones are only growing more disruptive and powerful as they ride the computational imaging wave. And they already exceed the convenience of cameras like the RX107 in terms of portability, connectivity, and ease of use. And they simulate bokeh better than the optical glass can do. But the 7th generation RX7 makes the best case I've ever seen for adding a camera in this segment to your toolbox. From its overperforming 1-inch sensor to its A9 inherited autofocusing, small but very useful pop-up push-down EVF, full-frame equivalent integrated 24-200mm to zoom lens, 180-degree tilty screen, and actually usable and useful control dial surrounding the lens. This is the camera to take when you refuse to take your dedicated camera with you because it's just too much. Say an evening on the town with the love of your life. Yet, you harbor the sneaking suspicion that you'll feel totally naked without a real camera. And, subsequently, miss the shot. At 1300 bucks, the RX107 is expensive for what it is, but I look at it this way. It's the going rate for peace of mind for the control and IQ freaks among us. You know who you are. On the other hand, $1,300 seems like a bargain compared to our 2019 compact full-frame camera of the year, the $5,000 Leica Q2. 
Leica carried over everything that was already great about the original Q. Industrial design, build quality, feel, and that incredible fixed autofocusing manual 28mm 1.7 Sumalux lens, and then engaged in warp drive. The most important piece of that was replacing the 24 megapixel sensor with a 47.3 megapixel unit, essentially identical to that found in the SL2. Truly superb. But they also dramatically improved the EVF by moving to OLED and up the weather ceiling to that's important. The result is a home run. A half-price, autofocusing, EVF-only M10 with a better sensor and superb fixed lens that with this many megapixels arguably offers three lenses in one. And now that I think about it, actually, you could say that the Q2 is closer to one quarter or one fifth the price of an M10D when you add in the cost of 28, 50, and 75 millimeter manual focus Leica glass. It is a gateway drug to the world of Leica. It is a camera for which you will serve as steward before handing it down as a family heirloom, an instrument that you will use with intent wherever you go, a talisman that will make you smile whenever you come home. You have been warned. But that doesn't mean you can't find Nirvana for less, which brings us to our 2019 street camera of the year, the Fujifilm X-Pro3. Hey, don't start up with me if you don't understand the appeal of a camera that offers a hybrid optical and electronic viewfinder, a flip-down tilty screen that hinges from the bottom and isn't even visible until you do so, and a price almost Half again, to be fair, what its less Nietzsche cousin, the X-T3, costs. Okay, I get it. It's fine. But for those of you who do understand it, those of you who already know how good the X-Pro2 is, for those of you who understand how good and uncompromised the Fujifilm dedicated crop sensor coverage only XF line is, for those of you who are street photographers, who also want to shoot waist level like you're rocking an old Hassi or Rolleiflex or only wish you could afford a Leica M10D, well... This $1,800 Fuji is for you, which in turn really couldn't be more different from our 2019 video-centric hybrid camera of the year, Panasonic's Lumix S1H. This is a full-frame 6K 24P 10-bit 422 up to DCI 4K 60P 10-bit 422 as well, all internal and recording hybrid camera. But it just also happens to come with an excellent 24 megapixel sensor, 5.7 million dot UXG EVF, the best IBIS in the full frame space, and a full blown flippy slash tilty screen for four grand. It's the first hybrid to be added to Netflix's list of approved cameras, meaning this sucker is operating in the same space as vastly more expensive Aries, Reds, Canon C700s, Sony Venices. You get the idea. If it had autofocusing as good as a Sony A9, you could argue it comes closer than any other hybrid camera to perfect. You could argue that right now. And I might agree with you, but hold that thought for a few more minutes. Next, our 2019 medium format camera of the year award, which goes to Fujifilm's $10,000 GFX 100. I mean, 102 megapixels in body image stabilization, that same 5.7 million dot UXG EVF, phase detect autofocus. What other medium format camera has that? I mean, none. DCI and UHD 4K video recording up to 420 10-bit internally or 422 10-bit externally via HDMI, F-Log Gamma, and some outstanding glass. A 10 grand, it's not for everyone. No. And cameras like the Sony a7R4, Panasonic Lumix S1R, Nikon C7, like a SL2, are nipping at its heels for far less. I'm also more used to them. It also suffers competition from Fujifilm's own 5000 GFX 50S and Hasselblad's Sub-6000 X1D2. But there's really not much to argue about with that IBIS EVF megapixel count and phase detect AF. Even if it's not as fast or nearly as light as the other cameras I've mentioned here, this is the medium format camera with which it is easiest to coax the most from that super full frame sensor, off tripod especially. Okay, we've only got a few more categories before we announce the biggest winner of all, so please stay with me. Our 2019 design of the year goes to the Leica SL2. Ugh. Some of us will lament its brutalist design vocabulary. And it is true that the internal code name for this 47.3 megapixel full frame in body image stabilized, gorgeous to my eyes and in my hand camera was Vader. Others of us will lament the price. I hear you. 
Maybe even the fact that it doesn't have phase detect autofocus. But from its industrial design to ergonomics, build quality, feel in hand, and native lens line, there is simply nothing else like it. Other than, of course, its predecessor, the original SL, and I did a four-part series. If I remember, I'll put links to all of this stuff down in the show notes below, maybe even up above. But once again, Leica pulled out all the stops with this update. They not only added IBIS, a new higher resolution sensor, processor, significantly more performant autofocus, and 5.7 million dot UXG EVF, that they not only refined the grip, the covering, the chamfers of the body, the materials used, the visual cues surrounding the lens mount and top EVF shape, that they managed to remove the Igor what hump communications hump on the camera, improved the menu system and touch interface while retaining all that made the original an icon in its own right has made the camera so compelling to me that I acquired one the day it first became available. Like the Q2, I experienced it as a talisman, urging me to do better work and making that work count. Now, I just have to wait patiently for the Summicron SL35 with its name on it for me. Of course, at six grand, the SL2 is the most expensive full-frame, interchangeable lens mirrorless camera on the market. And I will not assert to you that you can't get as good or better imagery from any other camera or lens line. The final image is always so much more than the gear, you know that. But returning to price for a moment, if Leicas speak to you as no other cameras do, if, among other things, IBIS, high resolution stills up to 20 frames per second, internal DCI 4K recording to 30 frames per second, UHD internal recording up to 60 frames per second, DCI 4K up to 60 frames per second recorded externally, a unique micro lens design sitting atop the sensor designed specifically for manual focus wide angle M glass, and what I consider to be the best ergos and menu system in the segment ring your bell. It's interesting to note that the SL2 is only $1,000 more than the Q2 and $2,000 less than an M10D. Maybe I have to call this my favorite camera of the year. I do, don't I? I would be remiss, however, if I didn't recognize our 2019 concept of the year, Hasselblad's 907X. Okay, not everyone cares about design, let alone homage, even if it is to one of the greatest camera designs of all time. I'm talking about the Hasselblad V-Series, introduced in 1948 with the launch of the 1600F. I imagine even fewer people care about an homage which bridges the analog and digital worlds. I could be wrong, but that is the ambition of the 907X, and I'm excited to see it. I'm excited for Hasselblad. To be fair, Hasselblad's 907X is not simply a concept. It is already announced, but as it is not yet shipping, and I have not spent hands-on time with a working unit, I can only admire the 907X from afar after holding a non-operable prototype in hand. I am really curious to see what it will be like once in production. With this said, I think now is a good time to announce our overall Camera of the Year winner for 2019, and that is, shocker, Sony's A7R4. The 61 megapixel, in-body image stabilized, 5.7 million dot UXG EVF, that's a Sony unit, hybrid phase detection, real-time tracking, real-time IAF in video enabled A7R4 is an exceptionally capable technological tour de force. And an operational and marketing tour de force aggressively priced at 3500 bucks, But it also comes to market with a native mount, state-of-the-art, dedicated full-frame mirrorless lens line surpassed, let alone equaled, by no one. So what if the ergonomics or build are still nothing to write home about? So what if the menu system remains infuriating, the touch system maddeningly incomplete? So what if it doesn't record 10-bit video internally or externally in an age of YouTube and internet compression? I'm not being facetious. It is simply the case that no other camera, no other camera system can do so much so well at any price in the real world, let alone this price across so many use cases and users. No system will capture a higher proportion of shots or clips in focus. No system can make better use of the megapixels. We came pretty close to purchasing one ourselves earlier this year, because if you take the time to learn it, really learn it, and then spend enough time using it, if I'm honest with myself, if we're honest with each other, none of us can really deny its rightful claim to the title. But we should acknowledge the Panasonic S1 twins as worthy honorable mentions. Okay, 
one more gear category, and then we move beyond the gear. We're almost at the end. Given that it is the silly season once again, our pick for 2019's deal of the year, grab it before it's gone, no buyer's remorse when something even better comes along. Yes, we make money on our affiliate links, though not remotely as much as you think, but thanks for supporting our channel anyway. The firmware 2.0 updated Panasonic Lumix G9, and now already rarer than hen's teeth, the Fujifilm X-H1 with battery grip, each currently selling for a thousand or even less when bundled. I'll put it to you plainly, though you can also see our individual videos on each. These are extraordinary and extraordinarily complete cameras, and at the moment, or depending on when you watch this, were the best entry points into two complete and outstanding lens ecosystems in the crop sensor world. Between the two, I would definitely give the nod to the G9 for video, to the X-H1 for high-performance stills photography. It's very clear. Seriously, get them while you can. Will there be new models to replace them? Look, there usually are when prices come down to this point. Is that a reason not to buy them? You know what? I don't think so. There's a reason these are either selling or sold out so quickly, and we love both of them. Four categories left, the last one being my favorite, as I've said, our annual Elephant Award. But first, our 2019 royalty-free music and sound effects source, Epidemic Sound. I will be doing a separate video on how and why music is so important to my video work. But for now, I'll just tell you, since so many people have asked, that I use Epidemic Sound. In fact, I like them so much, I was happy when they contacted me and asked me if I wanted to become an ambassador for them. So, use the link down in the show notes below to sign up for a free trial. You're going to dig it. Next, our 2019 website builder, Squarespace, again. I've been using Squarespace since, I think, 2014. And just a few weeks ago, I put up my fifth, sixth site for my recent photography. Check it out, hughbrownstone.photography. I've simply not found a faster, easier, cheaper, more beautiful, or more responsive customer service website builder out there. No affiliate links on this, guys. No special discounts. This is not being sponsored by them. Sorry. It's just what it is. One more category before our annual Elephant Award, and that is for our 2019 winner of the Photography or Movie-Centric Film of the Year. The web is an amazing place. I get a DM on Instagram, direct message from a guy I don't know, who says essentially, hey, love your work. I'd love to show you mine. He then goes on to invite me to the New York screening of his documentary entitled, Show Me the Picture, The Story of Jim Marshall. Who? But a brief Google search on Jim Marshall, for those of you who don't already know, reveals to me that he was one of the great mid-century photojournalists covering modern jazz and rock and roll at their births. A tortured soul, too. So, Alfred George Bailey, the film's director, and I agreed to hop on FaceTime, and when we do, it's awesome. Alfred, you are awesome. I think he's great. I then watch his other documentary on Gregory Porter that I think is amazing. I didn't know who Gregory Porter was either, but I'm okay with it. What any of us knows fades into insignificance compared to what we don't, which is why saying yes and meeting people like Alfred is so beautiful. Anyway, a week or three later, and I'm standing at the Sinopolis Chelsea on 23rd Street in Manhattan during Doc NYC talking to an executive producer, Amelia Davis. Alfred's visa doesn't get sorted in time, so that meeting in real life will have to wait. But I watch the film. I have a bunch of OMG moments. OMG, he photographed John Coltrane, which is why Miles Davis asked him why he didn't take pictures of him like that. OMG, he photographed the very last Beatles concert at Candlestick Park. OMG, he was the chief photographer at Woodstock. OMG, you get the idea. Anyway, I start reading about him, including his own book on his rock and roll photography entitled Not Fade Away, and Amelia's book on Jim created as a result of the film, which she ought to know a little something about since she was his assistant and friend for decades. All of which is a long-winded way of saying when or if you can see it, do. And finally, our 2019 Elephant Award goes to, already, 
much bigger awards than this, award-winning Chinese photojournalist. And by that, I mean awarded multiple times by the World Press, winner of the Henri Nanan Prize for Photojournalism, grant recipient from the W. Eugene Smith Memorial Fund, the Prince Klaus Foundation, and National Geographic. Yeah, I'm talking about Lu Guang. Most of you probably haven't heard of him. Now, I give this award, the Elephant Award, to the best example, through image making, of the three blind men and an elephant ethos, which I'll sum up as taking the time to truly understand what we are seeing by synthesizing the views of it from multiple angles. This award is not about the gear, not even about the imagery, so much as the people behind the imagery and the result of the imagery. As I said a moment ago, this year's winner is Lu Guang, though to be more precise, we can say it is about his story. Because just about a year ago, while traveling in China, he disappeared without a trace. A few months later, the world learned that he'd been detained by Chinese authorities because, apparently, they didn't like his photographs. Photographs of China's pollution, of pollution's impact on Chinese people. This is not a unique problem. I was so struck by the injustice of it, his incarceration for documenting reality, and I so did not want to be a passive bystander watching this injustice that I started a petition for his release. More than 1,300 people signed, guys, thank you so much. But still, we heard nothing. I Googled him earlier today. I confess I hadn't kept up to date. I'd stop looking. It's what people like those who incarcerated him count on, I'm ashamed to admit. And then I read it. He was released several months ago to what might be considered house arrest. I don't know how he's doing. I hope he's okay. I hope his full freedom comes soon. I don't know the man. I've never met him. And I am certain With the best of intentions, my little petition was not instrumental in his release, but I didn't do nothing. His images, they speak for themselves. His treatment at the hands of a government, which in the end are just people, speaks volumes as well. The story, and Toto, as much as we know of it, informs our understanding of the differences that too often arise between leaders and the people they purport to lead. The difference between truth and propaganda the two types of lies, lying by commission and lying by omission, the power of imagery, the power of censorship to suppress speaking truth to power, the interconnectedness of all of us, the universality of shared experience, and the reminder that all that is necessary for evil to thrive is for good men to do nothing or zone out in front of the TV or computer. Now, that was some 21st century Edmund Burke right there. I cannot think of a story or person more deserving of our 2019 Elephant Award. Lu Guang, I hope to meet you someday. (laughs) Guys, thanks for staying with me. Thanks for subscribing. If you're not already a subscriber, joining the conversation below and supporting the work we do by, yes, thank you, using our affiliate links, buying some swag, sending some coffee money via PayPal, or joining us on Patreon. That's it. For Three Blind Men and an Elephant, I'm Hugh Brownstone. Again, thanks for staying with me to the end. Happy, healthy, merry. See you soon.